That is quite the frame rate drop. Seems like some optimization is in order. <laughs> to infantilize interactions is to disrespect the player. This thought keeps crossing my mind during the many walking sequences, cutscenes and cutie set pieces that dot serious adult AAA games. It is especially striking when considering what is popular with a younger audience by contrast. Titles that require you to learn and master a system without that much guidance or narrative. Some games don't respect the player as someone capable of appreciating freedom of interaction, while other games do. Supraland is one such game in spite of what its aesthetics might lead one to believe. A first person puzzler with old school shooting and backtracking level design set in a sandbox animated by a child's imagination. As its own product page indicates, this is a game defined by remixing concepts, not just atmosphere and look, but systems as well. The tutorial begins on a simple note, water has stopped flowing for the red toys and the prince is tasked with investigating the matter. Outside of providing the classic function of making the player learn the ropes, the tutorial also gives the first taste of Supraland's strength. Supraland is a game that respects the player, both their intellect via puzzles and their instinct via secrets. This is not achieved through a particularly grueling difficulty, instead the game employs a well-paced cleverness. Most puzzles have a low number of elements, the emphasis being on discovering new interactions rather than memorization and multi-step solutions. Even amazing puzzle games have a tendency to degenerate into ever-increasing complexity without exploring new ideas. Supraland doesn't need to do this since the puzzles themselves are a means to an end which in this case is the player's relationship to the world, and movement plays an essential role in this. After the prince discovers the blues are responsible for the water shortage, he and the queen go on an adventure to deal with the issue and thus the tutorial ends. The very first upgrade the player is presented with is the double movement speed followed in quick succession by the double and triple jump. This is an informal invitation to explore in game design form given how late these upgrades usually come in other games. The possibility space of where the player can explore and reach is huge right from the get-go to encourage the childlike glee of running around this sandbox landscape. The best way the game acknowledges this glee is by the placement of certain secrets. Chances are that veterans of video games have gone out of bounds at least once. There is an intrinsic pleasure in reaching places the level designer didn't want the player reaching. Supraland knows this and as such rewards the behavior. What in other games would be meditative dead ends where the limitations of the games are recognized, here they are filled with secrets that recognize the player. From this perspective, the aesthetics fit very well with the drive to explore in all directions, much like a child would. In which case the parent would be the developer developer who has a very light but caring touch. An NPC asks if you are part of the 90% while in front of a gate puzzle. After a while, they will say that 90% of players forget that the force cube ability can be used to block the gate. It's so cheeky since the player did the same puzzle a while back, it is banter on the dev's part without seeming antagonistic. This type of interaction reveals so much about the game's core intention. It is about freedom with supervision. You are free within reason. And yet, it is still a lot more freedom than in many other games which draw from the same influences as Superland. Influences which this game actually surpasses in some measures. 34 years have passed since Metroid released, and now obvious signposted barriers blocking players lacking a specific ability have become rote, to the point of being a fun tax due to the expected backtracking. Superland doesn't feel this way due to the masterful integration of the primary puzzle solving upgrades with the level design. For the first few hours the game is pleasant, though you would be hard pressed to call it anything special. Then this happens. <laughs> the 
the magnet upgrade suddenly recontextualizes the entire journey that the player was on. Every metal object is now a vector of movement to consider. This is the masterstroke in the game's design. The milestone upgrades do not give access to the world, rather they break the limitations of the player. Each one acquired suddenly results in a burst of freedom which in turn feeds the drive to find secrets hidden all over the land. Supraland gives a sense of growth to the player that is not tied to statistics. Instead, it is tied to mastery of traversing the environment. What's more, it is not just the avatar of the player that increases in power and versatility. The game does something that other Metroid-style titles very rarely engage in, which is use knowledge as a direct quantifier of player growth. Near the starting Red Village, there are some giant carrots blocking a path. Much later is the concept that fireflies eat carrots introduced. If you are starting a new game again, or figure this out by yourself, you can unblock this path from the start. The game has rules to be understood that don't always rely on a curated list of power-ups to toy with. This type of tinkering is applicable to puzzle solutions as well. In this instance, the player is supposed to figure out how they can activate this jump pad to reach and pick up an anvil. Alternatively, they can find an appropriate angle to get a good shot and get the anvil that way. Taking all of this together, Supraland can be quite magical at times. The fast travel is particularly noteworthy given how much of the world can be seen and it provides a good frame of reference for when, at the end, the prince becomes the fast travel. The contrast between the first few steps taken at the ground level of the village and the towering heights that can be reached above it is something very few games have achieved. The way the player looks at the world and how it works is completely different from start to finish and that's really the game's greatest strength, the recontextualization. The game borrows genre conventions not to mimic the experience of predecessors but rather to put a positive spin for those who already know them. The hybridization itself is also quite interesting to discuss. Superland is like like Zelda, Metroid and Portal, not at the same time though, and that is a key part of the game's pacing. At its heart, Supraland is a first person puzzle game. Outside of looping twice to a central location and one short backtracking section, the main path is quite linear. The game is made up of canyons which form a sequential series of challenge rooms that have a very straightforward path towards a puzzle with secondary secrets being spread about. Thus the differentiation between main and side content is baked into the level design. For example, the the player exits this tunnel and enters a canyon. The puzzle at the far end is the main path. Everything else, the farm, the house, the cave, all of that is side content. This separation makes the player intuitively pace themselves in regard to exploration. They can at any point dip out of the search for secrets and progress via solving the puzzle at the end of the area. Superland is not a perfect game though, far from it. There is Carrot Town, which is an exception that proves the rule situation. This huge open area requires multiple interlinked linked puzzles to progress, with side content interspersed throughout them. It is not terrible, but it feels lacking in focus. The player doesn't know if they have completed something that will get them to the next area until they are there. As such, it is very easy to feel a sense of meandering while doing these puzzles. Still, this is a blemish compared to the big issues. Superland is a game made mostly by one man in Unreal, and the engine does a lot of the work. It is safe to say that this game wouldn't exist without a commercial engine. The developer's focus was on this design, that is where his triumphs lie. In turn, the other parts of the game are far more lacking when compared. The concept of the sandbox world is good, it fits with the gameplay, it is the execution that is wonky. The absence of a professional art director leading a team of modelers to create a specific vision is felt in how the world is put together. Take scale as an example. This is a pickaxe, this is a wrench, this is a pencil. The size of these objects feels wrong and the player's mind picks up on little details such as these which breaks the illusion. It is not an outright ugly game and the simplicity of its looks is charming once you get used to it. That being said, it is far from a perfectly realized aesthetic vision. Speaking of aesthetics, they have actually gotten worse than at launch due to an engine update which fiddled with the lighting and post-processing effects. The bloom in particular feels a lot worse. It burns! <laughs> 
You can tell which footage is which by the cactus model that got replaced along the way. On the one hand, it feels very justified to be upset by these types of visual issues. On the other hand, I've come to expect this from Unreal projects. It is a common issue with this commercial engine since these graphical ready-made options are a template meant to be adjusted on a per-project basis. However, modifying them requires a lot of expertise. 3D graphics programming is its own separate industry essentially. Given the scale and budget of the project, it is a take it or or leave it type situation, even though what is taken is sloppy. This sloppiness is also present on the thematic side of things. Supraland relies heavily on references and memes to the point that they become a creative fallback rather than a creative choice. A franchise that shares a similar vision to this game is Army Men, but what carries that particular setting is the seriousness of the toy soldiers. There are jokes left and right, and yet the little green men partake in the war effort with grim determination. That's amusing, and it is the glue which makes the setting stick together. By contrast, Supraland weaves in and out of the text of the adventure, the subtext of the child's imagination and the meta text of the developer inserts. It does so in, like I said, a very sloppy manner. For example, toys don't have a neck, their head levitating above their bodies probably for production purposes. While in the fiction of the child's imagination this is fine, in the intro we can see the child is placing a red toy. The neck is also absent thus creating a break in reality. It would have been a great little detail if in this instance the the toy was actually attached properly to the body, creating visual cues to when the game shifts perspective. Such details would have gone a long way to keep the three types of reality layers in check and maybe even add genuine jokes with punchlines. The referential content in this game is used to blot out weaknesses in the writing thereby also acknowledging the existence of these weaknesses. Take this moment, a red and blue toy have a hidden romance, this could be the starting off point for a Romeo and Juliet pastiche, but instead it is just a reference, it doesn't go anywhere. And to make something clear, this is a criticism in regard to a lack of punch to the writing, not the quantity. Superland doesn't need an in-game encyclopedia explaining where the rattlehag boss comes from and what is its function within the ecology of the sandbox. All in all though, Supraland's aesthetics and humor get the job done at best and make the game feel like a total asset flip project at worst. Which is the actual case with the skeleton combatants that are taken straight off the Unreal store. This brings us to the weakest part of this title, the old school shooter combat. Unlike the other systems in the game, there really is no creative spin that toys with genre familiarity. Focusing on those would be a mistake since the core issue is not one of execution, it is of creative vision. In terms of how the player really relates to the environment, puzzles represent the static environment, exploration represents environmental traversal, and combat would represent the mobile environment, where solutions must be found on the fly against moving parts and pieces that are trying to harm the player. Unfortunately, that is not what happens. The main role of combat seems to be to provide some form of catharsis by killing monsters and have an excuse to pad out the secrets with minor upgrades. This makes it play second fiddle to the movement which already provided the pleasure of bouncing around certain for secrets. Combat interrupts rather than joins the flow of exploration and puzzle solving which weave in and out of each other much more elegantly. Dark Messiah of Might and Magic is an example of how Supraland should feel. This game does allow the player to engage in the process of whittling down enemy HP through attacks, yet it also encourages smart use of the environment to achieve the same killing ends much faster. Mastery of Battlefield Surrounding has a real tangible effect in how well the player can handle a horde of enemies, while in Supraland it really Really doesn't make a difference. There is also a separation between puzzles and shooting that feels unnatural given the freedom the game encourages. One upgrade allows wooden objects to be pulled and this doesn't work on enemy wooden shields. Yanking them out of the skeleton's hand would feel so much more like Supraland. Instead, there is an upgrade that destroys the shield with a basic attack. To be clear though, Dark Messiah is primarily a melee game while Supraland is a shooter so it is not a one-to-one -one comparison in terms of experience. Instead, it is about the essence of the combat how it feels and what it asks of the player. Imagine an area filled with explosive barrels and skeleton archers that have flaming arrows. The player can shoot at the barrels to kill the archers, but any arrow that misses might trigger an explosion which harms the player. Those type of combat set pieces would feel much more at home with the environmental mastery that Supraland focuses on, rather than the current by the numbers retro shooting which is just filler between the genuinely good puzzle solving and exploration. Still, the combat sections are short enough to be uninteresting instead of straight up tedious or annoying. The Crash DLC doesn't have the courtesy to avoid such emotions. This 
side adventure feels like the offal of the developer's ideas. We got the fine cuts in the main game, here we are feasting on the raw tripe. Does a waiting puzzle make Supraland a better game? The answer is no. The biggest offender here is the structure and the changes it imposes upon the content. The prince goes on a journey with a rocket that crashes in the land of the orange toys. Then he proceeds to gather scrap to make a new rocket so this process can be repeated around half a dozen times. This recursive content progression where the player loops around the same area again and again with minor changes simply doesn't benefit the Supraland experience. It is hard to find a legitimate justification for the looping outside of the developer having an infatuation with it which results in trying and failing to make it work. An addendum to this game could seemingly go one of two ways, invent an entirely new ability set to repeat the base game or create an expert scenario where the puzzles take into account that the player finished the base game and might want a challenge. Crash does none of this, opting to take away the player's gear and making them repeat the base game with the magic of the recontextualization gone. The candles are emblematic of this issue, they are a map-wide puzzle that is present from the beginning and has a very obvious solution. The tool needed to light these candles is one of the last the player gets so they are confronted with this yet unsolvable puzzle over and over again with each crash reiteration. It is the polar opposite of the moment when the magnet is acquired. To make matters worse, the reward for this is two bones. One of the two resources, the other being scrap, that make up the vast majority of rewards, both of which are mandatory for finishing the game. This is another aspect that is ruined from the base game. The delineation between side and main content gets blurred, thus turning the entire DLC to a long-form version of Carrot Town. To be fair, there are some positive aspects. Some of the puzzles would have been nice inclusions in the base game and there is an improvement in terms of production value, with better animations, sounds and constant if slight changes to the world. To give credit where credit is due, Orangeburg feels livelier and more dynamic than the blue or red town. Combat also feels less like filler since it has been almost entirely removed which is a positive to a point. Towards the end one might actually miss it. This DLC also toned down the meme humor a little and filled the void with actual narrative. Unfortunately, this proves to not be one of the developer's fortes. Plot lines appear and have no payoff such as these greasers that are set up by a cutscene yet have no impact beyond that. Weirdly enough, character motivation now also comes into play since it is revealed that the world keeps getting reset and the base game is presumably already destroyed. This is a serious reveal, just listen to the music. Suddenly we are playing an existential nightmare, why would the prince even care about the rocket at this point? None of this gets answered since the writing doesn't seem interested in that. The credits even show the complete destruction of the crash world set to cheery music. It is to be appreciated that the developer attempted a more involved narrative, but it is clear that, at least in this DLC, the concept of juggling the three layers of reality that compose Superland's story have yet to be mastered. I don't wish to end on a sour note here, so let me mention that Superland 2 is already in production and is taking the logical step of coming up with new abilities. We can only hope that Crash will serve as a lesson about what works and doesn't in the Superland formula so the second game can surpass the first. Was hat er, was ich nicht hab? Ich bin ein Kavalier. Ich hab alles, was man braucht, um dir zu imponieren. Warum 
Superland is a scrappy underdog, and as such it is not what one would call a smooth experience. The good however more than makes up for the bad. It is refreshing to see overused concepts presented in a new and thoughtful manner. Its nature as a one-man project leads to inevitable yet understandable flaws in terms of aesthetics, narrative and even gameplay given the ill-fitting shooting component. But none of this stops it from being a good game, it just also is simultaneously the prototype for an amazing game. We will see if Superland 2 manages to deliver on this potential. Even so, the first game stands as an excellent example of seeing player freedom as something to be valued. Thus, in turn, the player can value the game back.